today on Top Gear Rearview, Jeff totally forgot what he was supposed to say. I know, I totally forgot. I was like, what am I supposed to say? And it was me. I was that Some ran into your Mazda and it didn't ever look right, though. Hello and welcome to Top Gear Rearview. I'm Jeff, that's Brady. Tonight we're taking a look back at Series 2, Episode 4. This JAG-themed episode aired on the 1st of June, 2003, and the star in a reasonably placed car is Boris Johnson. Uh, yeah, very JAG-themed this one is. Uh, we start off with uh, taking a look back, or excuse me, a look forward at one of their concepts, and a look back at some of the Jaguars of yore. Um, there's a, uh, a segment about the XJ, specifically the XJR, um, and then rounding things out, we have a look at the XKRR, which didn't really exist, but uh, it's kind of mm, contemporary the DB7 GT, which is the hot lap of the episode. Yeah, it's a it's kind of, it seemed like a thin episode, but they really go into Jag history for like the first half of the whole episode is about the history they do. of Jag. But we'll and start honestly, with it's a good the, history. But yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll start with this this looking forward. It's the R Coupe. Um, I thought that thing looked like a Veyron. I thought that thing looked ugly. I agree, but I like it had the front end with like the kind of rounded and the uh, the four uh, headlights. I was like, yeah, I see a lot of Veyron in this. Uh. It, you know what it looks? It looks like a Bentley Continental. Uh, yeah, I'll give you that. I mean, yeah. they they kind of share. It's that kind of rounded front end with yeah. the uh, with those four lights and the kind of big center grill. I mean, that's uh, yeah, it's kind of the, the same all around. But I think Jaguar the, uh, was all in on those four little headlights. Uh, oh yeah, with the XJ over so many years, the XJ was produced with those four headlights for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, and it still—I mean—it didn't have quite as smooth. It still had the kind of bumps in the hood that came along with the uh, with those four headlights and other models. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not a lot of details on this guy, but uh, I did looking into the episode. I was there were a couple other Jaguars that came out, uh, Jaguar um, concept cars that came out at the same time, and I thought they were way more interesting. So I wanted to talk about those instead. <laughs> okay, what were they? So the first one is the XF10. XF10. Uh, I'm looking at I it will, now. Ooh. I will definitely throw up a, a picture in the show notes. It is a wild departure from the uh, from the contemporary Jaguar looks with the the four headlights, or like if you're looking at the uh, the XK, the kind of dual headlights that looks more like a DB7. Um, it is nothing like any of those. <laughs> it almost looked Cadillac-y to me, um, but meh, maybe not. It has it has a unique shape too. Yeah, but, uh, we'll, we'll we'll call it unique. It almost looks like that. Uh... Was it that Peugeot diesel supercar that they showed last season? Yeah. It looks a little maybe. bit like that, a little bit. It's a little faster. It had a 7-liter V10 putting out 640 horsepower. Mm. I mean, it's yeah, a concept so it's, car, but yeah. Yeah, I'll agree. Yeah, but uh, yeah, their, their 0 to 60 number is 3.8, and they said it had a, a theoretical top speed of 2.10. So, you know, not messing around. Obviously, it didn't go anywhere, but yeah. uh, cool car to try it out. It really doesn't look like that style got inbred into any of their, like not even the oh. new F-Type or anything, the new XK, anything like that. It was a complete outlier, but yeah. um, it's not the other very one, pretty. It's I didn't hate it, you know. Honestly, compared to some of the like, uh, there's the the X Type is one of my least favorite cars. Yeah, um, that's a good point. Did not care for that one. Um, so what's the other one? But they also the other one is the RD6. RD6. Uh, the R D6, which came out again in 03. and uh, this one was interesting because it was more of a potential like this. This could have been not necessarily like a hypercar, but just like a car car. It was a five door hatch and it had the kind of the freestyle doors or whatever they called it on the rx8 where they had the rear swing door i think they just they were part of ford at the time so mazda was in the same uh, same boat so they kind of used the uh, the same architecture mm-hmm. for those doors mm-hmm. i was about it's to say it looks, it looks like it might be a, a lot like an rx8 like i assume they share a lot yeah. um yeah that one had a 2.7 liter uh, diesel six, um, 230 horsepower, but still 500 foot pounds of torque. So 200, or so zero to 60 was less than six seconds. That's gutsy, man. That would have been a fun car. That um, probably you know, right? I, yeah, I, I could see that. Compared, to, it's just such a departure from the other two. You got these two like monster supercar looking things, and then this weird little five door that uh, you know could have been a, a new direction, but not mm. that never would have fit in with the product line. Do you see how the rear door opens in this? Did you see that picture? I don't think I did. It doesn't open up like a normal hatch. It's not a normal five door hatch style. It's a side hinge, but it Ooh, slopes so much <laughs> that it actually goes like straight up. Oh yeah, there it is. I see it. <laughs> you it's should like put that a, picture all... in the show notes. It it hinges from the side, but it's at an angle so much that it like has to come up and out. 
I think it's almost like a, a scissor door on a Lamborghini where it kind of opens up and then pivots. Maybe. I Looking don't know. At that it, hinge. Uh, yeah. Certainly looks Interesting like. Interesting little car, though. L- certainly looks like the hardest way to open a door because there's yeah, no like I mean, struts or anything helping it out. <laughs> you got to muscle that Just thing up. <laughs> get it up there and hope it's not windy in the wrong direction. Yeah, uh, I'm a sucker for a hatchback. So, you know, looking at this thing, I'm like, it's not a bad looking car. This would have been an interesting direction for them to go. I don't know if it would have sold at all because people would have been like, it probably would have been like 40 to 50,000 pounds. And people would have been like, what, did, what are you, what, who are you selling this to? Yeah. Yeah, they, so. they kept the four headlight look and the Jag grill for sure. But they kind of combined the headlights together to make it look a little sleeker. Um, yeah, it looks good. It's, it's a cool little car. Like I would have been, been interesting to see what the what it would have been if it came onto the market. Yeah, yeah. I think all of these, I'm checking right now, but I think they were all designed by Ian Callum. Um, I believe they were, uh, yeah, he was he was one of the Jag designers at the time, and I think he got the, you got to make all the cool stuff. Is he the guy who's on the Series 1 episode? Oh, you know what? I do not remember. Now I'm going to take a look at my notes. Uh-huh. Which, episode, which episode was that? Do you remember? Three? It was. Yep, there you go. Yeah. So if you there go back to our he... Series 1 Episode 3 uh, podcast, we talk about... Uh, both the guys were either former Jag or current Jag designers. One of them apparently was Ian Callum. And mm-hmm. both of their designs the ended up looking almost exactly like the F-Type. Uh, and yeah, nothing like very... any of these concepts, which is interesting. Well, Ian Callum eventually did make the F-Type. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so... <laughs> he, was, yeah. he was just drawing the F-Type. Yeah, he was like, well, here, here we'll just give a little bit away. Yeah. Um, oh, you know what? I lied. The XF10 is actually a different uh, automotive designer. It's Erwin Leo Himmel, who is uh, an Austrian. So, Himmel. Kind of makes sense why it looks nothing like any other Jaguar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, those are interesting. Yeah, those are definitely better looking than the R-Coupe. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. We'll post that it picture. It kind of looked like just a... It, I mean, it looks like a Bentley Continental, but it looks like a bulbous X-Type, and it's just... Yeah. That's not my favorite either. It's a pretty ho-hum looking car that they really rested their laurels on for, like, 15 to 18 years it's like yeah. that's the one you're gonna go with mm, i'm yeah. not sure about that choose better uh they uh after after they talk briefly very briefly i think we talked three or five times longer about the concept Easily. cars than they did um uh, they go into the history of jaguar and uh they talk a little bit about the car that put them on the map which was the c type it's called mm-hmm. um and it was uh, a race car. It was uh, not a... Uh, what did they ever sell the C-Type? I don't know if it was ever a road-going car. Yes, they did. They looks like they sold it under the badge of the XK120, and it looks exactly like the one they showed in the film. It does, and actually I got a note on the XK120. That was the fastest production car in 1949. Fastest it, in the world. So the, the C-Type was the fastest car in the world? Essentially, yeah. Wow. Well, they said that was the first car to lap Le Mans at an average of 100 miles an hour. Yeah, that was that was actually the uh, the story they were talking about, which was Duncan Hamilton and Tony Rolt. Uh, that was in 53, and uh, that was when they were both just pissed drunk. <laughs> what the, the proper term, Jeff, is hog-whimperingly bladdered. <laughs> I've listened to it. I have like three things crossed out here. I thought it was hog-witheringly. No, hog-whimperingly. Nope. Hog whimperingly bladdered is how drunk they were, which sounds like it was so drunk. Hamilton went into town. He found a local bar and he got hog whimperingly bladdered. Yeah. <laughs> I I mean I don't I like the story. Um and it sounds like the actual reason they were disqualified. Um so they were the the story if you haven't seen the episode they they were uh DQ'd. Um, and it was because they were practicing in a car that had the same number as another car on the circuit. Um, so they kicked him out and then the, uh, the drivers and the, well, yeah, uh, Holt and Hamilton went to the bar and got sloppy yeah. and then they decided to not kick them out and they came back and they were like, well, go drive, I guess. And, uh, they went so, it went so well that, uh, yeah, they had the fastest average speed and, uh, and won the race. They, uh, the quip they made in the episode, Jeremy says that. For those few pit stops, when they were refueling the car, they were giving the driver, Duncan Hamilton, they were giving him black coffee. And he was going, no, 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 this is making me all jittery. So in the second half, they were giving him brandy. <laughs> so he's topping him up. Fill the car up with fuel, fill him up with brandy, send him off again. So they're keeping him, they're hair of the dog in it to keep him into the, into the race, Sweet as spot. they were. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right in the zone. Um, yeah, Hamilton got hit in the face by a bird at 130 miles an hour. 
which broke his nose, and he kept on going. So, you know, I guess it, it helps to be drunk when you're getting hammered by a bird. We're going to need to go get hog whippering Lee Bladdard one day, Jeff. Yes, sir. The, uh, the, so a couple of the things they said about this Jag really were extremely British. Um, but, uh, and I don't know if any of these are uncouth or not good to say, but, uh, J- Jer- not Jeremy. James said that this set the tone for Jaguar. Cars for rotters, for cads, for absolute banders. I wrote down blanders, but I got the exact same quote. Blanders? Maybe absolute I don't know blanders. what it was. I can't understand you, James May. <laughs> it's blanders. Damn you, sexy blanders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, so they talk about the C type as kind of the car that really put. Jag on the map, which I would agree. You go out there and mm-hmm. you set records and stuff like that. You're going to do that. Fastest and then car they, in the world. That'll do it, yeah. And then they start talking about the Mark II, um, which I was not very familiar with. And it looks completely unassuming, but apparently it was a rather fast car. Yeah, I mean, their uh, their numbers were not amazing. It was 0 to 60 in eight and a half seconds, but well, I that's mean, all. Was, I mean, that's a while ago, so... It was like in the yeah. 50s and 60s, so... 63, I think, 63. So, yeah, they talk about the uh, Hammonds going waxing eloquent about the, jar, the Jag Mark II, specifically the 3.8. One thing I thought that was interesting is, um, I guess it wasn't terribly common, but this had all four wheels disc brakes. Yeah, I like the badge on the back and uh, and the reasoning behind it. It had a warning sign on the back, a little triangle. It said, uh, what, Dunlop disc brakes or something on it? And I think so. I think it was just like, yeah, this has disc brakes. Watch Don't out. <laughs> Don't, <laughs> Don't get too close. I'm going to stop way faster than you, and you're going <laughs> to slam into me with your crappy drum brakes. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy my bumper. But, uh, I mean, I guess it's a, it's a fine enough review from Hammond. There's not much... There's not much to say about it, but one thing that I want to talk about is he called the Jags. But the way we look at Jaguars today as fast, affordable, classy sports saloons was defined by this car. And I thought to myself, is that what I think of when I think of Jaguar? And it really isn't. No, me neither, but I think it's because we're in- we're Americans. Yeah, we're I really English. get a stuffy, uh, uh, old person, like, luxury, like, go slow, like a Cadillac. Yeah, now, uh, that's for everything but the F-Type. The F-Type, I still, I, I feel like that's a car that does not fit the mark at the moment, but I quite like. Well, I mean, I guess if you want to, if you want to think that that's what your perception of the of the car was, then either did the E-Type, so maybe that's just something that runs against the grain. Yeah, could be. I mean, Jag started, they were a race car maker, you know? Mm-hmm. They got put on the map by the C-Type, but... I guess here in America, they're really portrayed as like a luxury, like old man driving early in the morning, like because he's awake already sort of deal. Like <laughs> not because he's got to go to work. He's, paper. <laughs> he's long retired. He's on his way to not Golden Crowd, but, you know, somewhere real nice. Yeah. You know, the classy ones. But it's tea. Yeah. To, to have tea. And it, it's, I don't see them as fast, affordable, classy sports saloons. I see them as expensive, stuffy, old man cars. And it's really yeah. interesting that that's the perception that British people have of it, or is it just the perception that Top Gear has of them? be interesting to hear. Because that, really, you know, I saw some Jaguars over in the UK, and that didn't really change. You know, they have yeah. the XK. That's kind of blurring the line, and now the F-Type is, is absolutely a sports car. So maybe they're mm-hmm. trying to reinvent themselves exactly how Cadillac is. Could very well it's be. It's just the British Cadillac. It's the it's the it's the Cadillac of Britain. Well, the funny thing too is he called it the Super the the Mark II. He called it a Subaru Impreza at the time. And I was like, well, that doesn't really fit with it either. Like, I mean, kind of. I guess the Impreza is well, like I mean, a little. It, it is a sportsish saloon. That makes more sense fitting with their definition. But I guess it's you know comparison. you can get a lot of speed for cheap. He he was commenting yeah. how cheap it was. It was only like yeah, sixteen hundred yeah. pounds or something like that. You know, yeah. and I guess you know looking at the picture, it looks old to us. Yeah, but yeah. it's because it's an old car. You know, yeah, maybe that's just you know just putting putting a little bit too much onto it. It was probably a fast car. It seems like they were really building up as a fast car. Yeah, and I did like the uh, the story too of the um, the uh, robber or the um, the getaway guy that uh, liked to well he would steal these cars, but he stole the three four the three point four liter because it was a uh, he just liked the suspension more. He thought it was he a better car. Handled better. Yeah, it was the getaway driver for the great train robbery. Which is a, yeah. a big thing over there. 
All right. Yeah. Thus ended the, the Jag history lesson, apparently. Yep, yep. On to the news where we're talking about Ferrari stripes. Ferrari stripes. Yeah, I mean, in the realm of options that Top Gear has ever talked about, 3600 for a, like a different pay job doesn't seem like that that bad to me. No, I mean it's. I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of it's a lot, but it's. I mean, like it's on, it was on the Challenge Stradale, wasn't it? It was on like not the like. I mean, it's on the good car. You got the money already. Yeah, I mean, it's like you know, a lot of times they're talking about you. Know, you want to. Uh, you want like the double clutch gearbox instead of single clutch gearbox? Well, that's thirty thousand pounds. You know, yeah. it's like some egregious number. Thirty six hundred for a specialty paint job on a Ferrari. That's not that bad. No, nah, agreed. No, that's not too bad. Um. I guess that's all we're talking about on the Ferrari stripe. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there, there wasn't there much was, more to that story. <laughs> there wasn't too much, no. Um, they they talk about the MG in company again. It seems like they yeah. only ever talk about MG in the news. They don't ever do anything with them. There was that one super mini review where they talked about the ZR. Um, yep. But nothing else. Uh, James May was invited to a car park. No, no, this is important. But Hammond had a fun thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I first, like, this was the... Uh, reliability index and i think he said it was like reliability index.com and he immediately put like a stank on it like be, being that it's an internet-based thing it is inferior which was like, oh, oh he, he was calling it because it was on the internet and not like oh print. yeah it wasn't a it wasn't a publication yep uh, well, i thought it was funny it was like, thus yeah, have the times changed give, <laughs> give it a few years man <laughs> yeah it's interesting the list is awful Oh yeah, completely. Both sides of it. They were lot most reliable and least reliable. I mean, I probably would stand by Jeep being the least reliable. I don't know. It, I guess it all depends. And I mean, like modern day Jeep, maybe a little more. But that four liter, uh, that is a bulletproof engine. Yeah, the engine is fine. It's literally everything else they put onto the car. Like what? Like the body and the transmissions nah. and Wranglers last forever. The engine and the frame. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and then there's even not then, much, there's not the, much more to a Wrangler. They, well, touche. <laughs> <laughs> they're not they're they're reliable just because they just take everything that can break out. Eh, no yeah. more no more problems with the tachometer. Why? <laughs> eh, we don't have it anymore. Yeah, we threw it up. The glove box can't stay closed. Eh, take out the glove. No box. more glove box. Byo glove box. You know what? The roof keeps <laughs> rattling off. Ah, no more roof. Take it off. Um. Windshield's getting twitchy. I think Jeeps Bye-bye. are notoriously not good, especially transmissions. Uh, okay, uh, it's it, that one did not like that was not super surprising. But number two, unreliable was Subaru. That's awful. That's just I've owned so three wrong. Subarus and they are dead reliable. They're so wrong, so wrong. Yeah. Subaru being most second most unreliable. Uh, they said that Mazda was the most reliable. Mm. I'll give them that. Mazdas are pretty good. I don't know. The one Mazda I've ever been intimately close with was my roommate's Mazda. Uh, riding in it, you know, multiple times and stuff like that. It was broken all over the place. Maybe he didn't Dude, treat you, it very you well. You rode my Mazda. My Mazda was great. Yes, yeah, some some <laughs> ran into your Mazda and it didn't ever look right though. <laughs> um, true, true. Um, Second was Ford. Mm, that's a yeah, mm, especially at that time. Mm, yeah, probably yeah. not. And then third was Fiat, which is uh, which apparently is this, a was joke. A, this was a fee, it was. Just, it wasn't reliabilityindex.com. It was reliabilityindex.fiat.com because there's no way Fiat <laughs> makes it to the third spot. Even That's I know that. Bad. I haven't even stood next to a Fiat, and I'm like, oh, oh, those are unreliable. I've had one, uh, yeah, rental car. Not a fan. Would you have a 500? Oh, yeah. That's, that's cute. It's a cute car. I mean, it's, yeah, they were out of man cars. <laughs> <laughs> Talk more Looking about that next to the next episode. episode. <laughs> yep. All right, that's all I got for the news. Well, I mean, what would you say? What would you say is the least reliable brand? Uh, Fiat. Fiat. Um, <laughs> well, so uh, looking at like, I mean, I've seen recent ones, and it, the one that always pops up is like is now basically Fiat Chrysler. So Jeep's definitely in there. Yeah. And Ram trucks, Dodge, and Fiat. So mm-hmm. I don't disagree with those. Yeah, yeah, I would say that's probably true. They, they never really kept up on the reliability kick back in the 80s when Iacocca was running them. Yeah, so uh, that I, I think that'd be that'd be my thing. And then on the other side, I mean, Toyota Honda. I, there's no way those are not in the top three. Yeah, I don't know how Honda's not number one. Come on. Hondas are always lasting well, long time. Toyotas, I feel like, have been getting a little too big for their britches. They're not the same as they used to be. 
Yeah, but at, like early two thousands, that would have been like eh, they're doing pretty good at that point. They're starting to expand at that point, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They wanted to be the biggest car company in the world, and turns out they had biggest car company in the world problems. Yep. Yeah, I would say the most unreliable is probably. Uh, I've heard a lot of bad stuff about like Range Rover, Land Rover. Oh, that's a good one too. Yeah. Um, and then Chrysler, Fiat. I was going to say Chrysler, but they're all the same now. So Chrysler, Fiat. Yeah. Yep. I agree. So Mr. Boris Johnson, uh, I know very little about this guy. Well, Boris Johnson is, it's surprising at the time now, I, he was just a member of parliament. He was just an MP. He was not yet the mayor of London and then not yet any of his extravagant, his extravagant positions after that. I think he was like the foreign secretary. He's okay. he's very big in British politics. And I don't know uh, if he was very big at the time. Let me pull up his sheet here. So there's a TV show that they mentioned, something that sounded like basically like wait wait don't tell me on NPR over here, but like a TV show. Yeah, it's it's a panel show. They're all over the place in the UK. It's uh, I've got news for you. That was it. Yep. Yeah, explain that to me. Uh, it's like a once a week or maybe even a once a day show during the wow. week where they just go okay. over the headlines and make jokes. It's a bunch of comedians. It's like someone's hosting it. There's usually a regular host, and okay. sometimes they bring in guest hosts like Clarkson said he did it and Boris Johnson did it. And they get some comedians, and they just make jokes, play games. It's it's, it's really, totally way, way, don't tell me. It's exactly what it is, but it's okay. there's like 20 of them on a day. All right. Have I got news for you? Never mind the Buzzcocks. They're all over the place. QI. Stephen Fry runs QI. That was my favorite one. All right. Um, but... Yeah, so I wonder if at this point he was starting to gear up for this um, mayoral, mayoral run. run. Let me look at his time. Uh, no, he became the mayor of, of London in 2008. So he was, I can't assume he was starting to gear up for it in 2003. But he was, it was twinkling in his eye. He was thinking about it. I mean, he's he's a big, he's a big, for all of his buffoonery lookingness. <laughs> like if you just look up pictures of Boris Johnson, it's hilarious. Oh, His hair yeah. is awful, but he looks like uh, he looks like um, Harry from uh, Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. That's really good. Yeah, he does. Um, <laughs> I my my comment is what a mop on this guy. <laughs> um, yeah, I would completely he's, agree. He's he's. Uh, an aristocratic kind of guy. He's from the upper echelons of British society, and he's went to all of the good schools. He went to Eton. Mm-hmm. He went to Oxford. Uh, he's actually born in the United States. So he's a dual citizen. Interesting. Yep. Um, he. Um, but he. I. I think he's got a great voice, and he's very, very smart. I listened to an interview on him uh, by the Freakonomics guy, not Dubner. Maybe Dubner. Uh, yeah, Stephen Dubner's the main one, but there's uh, Levitt. Yeah, no, it was Dubner. So Dubner, okay. Stephen Dubner from Freakonomics did an interview with him, and he came across not at all buffoonish. He came across extremely well-read. I think he's like a literature major from Oxford, so he's extremely okay. well-read. He's extremely smart, um, but he, I think he's very ambitious in his political uh, uh, political career. Mayor of London, uh, there was a lot of a lot of speculation that he would have been uh, in the running for uh, prime minister right now. But I think he pulled out kind of smartly to not get in the way of this Brexit thing that's going on right now. Right. So I don't know. Maybe he was just getting himself out there. He's doing a couple TV shows. Maybe he's just becoming a well-known figure in this run up for him to be this big political figure. All right, fair enough. He was entertaining. I mean, mildly entertaining. I uh, didn't have a ton of notes, but I didn't dislike the interview. He's a uh, he's Not a funny a great guy. <laughs> no, he's a terrible driver. He's a terrible driver. It's funny. Look for a, a, a good picture of him. Is a picture on a on a bicycle. Have you seen the picture of him on the bicycle? No, I should probably look this up right yeah, now. Look it up real quick. He does. He did mention being a pretty avid cyclist. So, uh, and I like that because Clarkson is just the raging anti cyclist. So, yeah, I can approve. I can appreciate that <laughs> with the cocked helmet and the waving. Oh, there's him with Schwarzenegger. I mean, he he was kind of in line. He was the mayor of London, which is a very big thing. But yeah, he just looks like a doof, dude. <laughs> he looks huge... like such a doofus. I would like, yeah, he does not look remotely smart. But I could like his voice is really good. I could see 
Hearing him on the radio, you'd be like, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah, and he, uh, he, he, he made that comment about Homer and the student of Homer. And no one got it, and he's like, "That's what goes. That's what goes down as a good joke on Top Gear." It's like he's extremely <laughs> well read in in literature and in philosophy and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's not like an engineer or anything like that, but he's not dumb. He he plays an act and he plays it very well, and that's just fine. They did mention that too. They were like, "Yeah, you you seem to act dumb on the uh, you you seem dumb, but you're not." Yeah, you you play Politics the act of the smart, but they're not. <laughs> play the act of the blithering idiot. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think that's exactly what's going on. It's interesting. He's a Tory. He's a conservative. Uh, so he was he was very highly mentioned to be the prime minister right now, but I think he didn't want to be in the in stand on the railroad tracks when the Brexit thing came. He did yeah. a 156 bad lap. Not good. Nope. Moving on. All right. So the next jag we're going to talk about, Jeff. Is the XJR, or just in general, the XJ. Um, because you cannot get the XJSE because it looks like a fish or something. Uh, the, the grill, grill is different. pretty bad. We should probably throw a picture into the show notes. The grill is pretty bad. It's like I the agree. regular grill, but with like more chrome. It's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not to say that the XJ is a very good-looking car anyway. No. It's... It fits right into my image of Jaguar, which is the old. I stuff agree. That car. is, yeah, that is like right in the middle of my like, yeah. Um. So they did kind of a. I guess this was kind of a challenge. They did it a. It was yeah. It was it was like how far he could drive until he got bored. And my note was I lasted three minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> it was not great. No, no, it's a pretty. It was a pretty boring challenge. But he started off somewhere in Birmingham or something like that. And he just mm-hmm. kept driving north. And uh, talking about the car, uh, getting stuck in traffic, not a great challenge anyway. He made it all the way to John O'Groats, which is the top of Scotland. It's the northern okay. point on the Isle of Britain. And then he turned around and went back. Um, but he was talking about the air suspension. And then he was talking about r- driving on the twisty roads. He wasn't a huge fan of the air suspension, I guess, later in the episode or after the review. Yeah. But he seemed to really like it while he was driving on the twisty Scottish roads in the mountains. He did. I don't know about was, that. I, I, well, I think he, his complaints about the um, the suspension later was that it couldn't keep up on like the low speed, like the bumps and stuff. Like when you're kind of going over them, it was just it was not fast enough. But on the twisties, I mean, it's more so like it's pretty even and, and controlled transition left to right and stuff. So I could see it being like, you know, better at at, at damping through those. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, this particular one was just under 60 grand, which is a lot. Yeah. Uh, 4.2 liter V8, supercharged. Yep. Uh, he mentioned Fuel Light Bingo, which I was like, that is a terrible name for that game. It's Fuel Light Roulette. Come on. <laughs> it's absolutely Fuel Light Roulette. Yeah. What yeah. are you playing bingo with? You, you got five Fuel Lights there? <laughs> Someone in the back going... A quarter tank. <laughs> Qu- I guess. I Anyone got they- a spare quarter tank? Uh, yeah. The but um, I mean, it was yeah. And they were talking about the hill country and uh, how pretty it was, and I was like, cool. That doesn't look that pretty, but okay. Yeah, it's not that. I'm oh, sorry. The lake, the lake district, not the hill country. <laughs> the, the hill country is Texas. Yeah, I didn't see any lakes in the lake district. I think there's a quip about that. I don't think there's actually any lakes there. They're all called waters or ponds. <laughs> it's definitely right. a British joke. It's like, how many lakes are in the Lake District? Ooh, none. Ooh. None. Yep. No. Um, let's talk about something more important, Jeff. Let's talk yeah. about candy bars. Okay. <laughs> so, in, in this episode... On board. Uh, uh, way more on board than the XA. Uh, Clarkson's talking about what you normally eat when you're driving up and down the motorway. And he goes and gets some candy bars and he talks about the double decker. He talks about the flake. He talks about the Kit Kat and he talks about the Twix. So in my short tenure in the UK, uh, I ventured myself around the different candy bars that I've never seen before. You know, I tried to try foods that I've never seen before. Candy bars are right up my alley as a, you know, skinny guy that I am. And so I'd had all those. But I want to say, American candy bars in the UK do not taste the same as American candy bars in the, in the US. Less sugar? What do they do? They, no, I think it's all, everything's richer. 
It's a different. It's a different chocolate. Um, okay. So like Kit Kat tasted had a little more coffee flavor than it did over okay. here. Okay. Which was interesting. The one that does translate though, Twix. Twix is the same. Okay. You buy a Twix here and you buy a Twix there is the same. That being said, the double decker by far the best one of those four. Yeah. That was my go to once I tested. What the it hell out. is the double decker? It's got like two layers of nougat or whatever in it, caramel nougat and like a layer of chocolate in between. It's delicious. Okay. But uh, I was just going to bring up the fact that they taste different over here and over there. That's pretty much it. <laughs> that's fair. No, that's fair. I mean, it's like uh, it's like Coke and stuff, too. I mean, they're definitely different. They're yeah. different in the U.S., like different areas of the country. Yeah. Yeah. And you're just playing to, playing to your customer base. Whatever's going to literally sell you one more candy bar, you'll do it. Yep. Exactly right. But that's about as interesting as this XJ review was. I don't find it to be a very nice car. $60,000 is or 60,000 pounds at the time is way too many pounds to be paying for it. Yeah, that'd uh, be like 125 grand today. And that's like, what do you, I mean, no. Fast, affordable, classy <laughs> sports saloons. I don't think so. so I mean, yeah, it, I think that review especially plays right into like the old dudes just driving around stuffy like ex- using a candy bus. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> I do want to comment, though, before they ended, or right after they ended the XJ review, and right before they started the XK Double R review, which we'll move to, there was a brief freeze frame in the Amazon Prime, uh, I guess, view, where they were both standing next to a sign. Did you see this little glimpse? I don't think so. It was called the Greatest Car Vote, and it was a phone-in voting thing. They must have okay. cut it out of the episode because the phone number was used for something else or something like that. Yeah. I'm not sure. But what you could do is you dial a phone number and then the last two digits, would you would be able to vote for which car you thought was the best. Okay. Um, th- this is what I'm gathering from the the like three frames that this is in view. Interesting. I did not pay enough you attention. D- you didn't catch that. this? Well, this is good. No. I'm going to go through the list. So they have a list of greatest cars and you're supposed to vote for them. So we're going to go through the list. Okay. And uh, it's interesting what's on the list, but um... <laughs> man, we should do the phone number. We should just try to call it live on on this podcast. See what just happens. Just try it right now. <laughs> I can probably find it. I mean, it'd be an international call. You you could do it. Yeah. I'm not gonna do it. Nah, I cost some money. I yeah. got a work cell phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just call from your work phone. <laughs> All right. So greatest car vote. Uh, let me know if you agree or disagree. Uh, first one on the list. This is in no particular order, I suppose. First one on the list is the McLaren F1. Agree. That's it. Done. Let's go. Bro. <laughs> I don't think you can make a list of greatest cars with like a million dollar car. And I don't think that. Yes, you can. It's the F1. No, greatest car. No, Next question. I don't think you can. Number two, Ford Mustang. Uh, it's iconic. I'll give them that. Iconic. Yeah. I'll give you that. I, I think it's more reasonable to be on the list than a McLaren F1. But number uh, three. The reason, you didn't say most reasonable best car. No, I didn't. I didn't. Well, then the rest of these are not going to be in the same realm as that one. That number three is Black Cab. No. No. <laughs> no. I think you mean to say no. Hard no. Uh, number four is the Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud. I don't know enough about that. To, nah. I know that Silver Seraph and the Ghost. I mean, it's an old Rolls Royce. It's an old Rolls Royce? Okay. Yeah. No. No. Uh, E-Type Jag. Ooh, that's a good one. It might be close to the top of the list. That's in there. I see those occasionally, and every time I they, they snap my head around. Yeah. Uh, Land Rover. I say, presume, I wrote in here, presumably the original one. Not just okay. some random one from the late 80s, <laughs> you know? Yeah, Discovery. No. So, original no, Land no. Rover. Yeah, I guess it'd be like an American putting the Willys Jeep on the list. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah it's iconic. Again, it's, like a, it's an icon. Yeah. Uh, Audi Quattro. I love the Quattro, but no. Fiat 500. No. Citroen DS. Uh-uh. Well, so you said yes to the McLaren F1 and the E-Type Jag. So those will be your, your votes. I said Mustang. I take, I take Mustang on there. You said iconic. You didn't say best. Or it's tough because like you got to take the, i mean you, we got like the e-type that's one car you got the f1 that's one car you got the mustang that's like 11 cars mm-hmm. including the mustang 2 theoretically no 
Mm, okay. No. But that then that includes still the SN95 and like uh I mean that's just I hate that generation of Mustang. It's just so <laughs> ugly. Yeah. Yeah. I I guess I, I presume they're talking about one particular car here, so I assume that would be the original Mustang. Okay. So if we're talking like yeah, like mid 60s, I, I that's a good car. 64 and a half is the first Mustang. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean, I might actually put the Fiat 500 on that list. The original Fiat 500. I'm, I like them I, so much more than the current ones. I'm presuming they're talking about the original one again here. Oh, yeah. The Fiat 500 the really doesn't exist yet. Yeah, it really was. You know, the, the car they're missing on here that should probably be on here is the... The Mini. <laughs> Wait, that wasn't the one I was thinking of. But why isn't the Mini on this list? It should be instead of the Fiat 500. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they're saying the Fiat 500 because the Mini came after it. I'm not sure. Uh, I was going to say the, the Volkswagen Beetle. Corvette. There's so many other cars that should be on that the list. The Corvette should not be on anybody's list. For yes, it cars. should. No. Come on. Yes. No. Yes. no. Yeah, I mean, I guess you're looking at, you're looking at these. McLaren Astronauts drive Corvettes, Brady. <laughs> Astronauts used to drive Corvettes. <laughs> Astronauts probably yeah. drive Lexus 430s now. Uh, you're looking at these these are all look like they're the beginning of a I guess a trend or a, they're like the iconic car at the beginning of a of a movement like if you have a list of greatest hard rock bands ever Black Sabbath always has to be near the top because they were like the first mm-hmm. so like Ford Mustang is the first like they, they chose a car to represent the American muscle, car. muscle cars yeah. the Fiat 500 they chose a car to represent the small, quick, fun car of the people. Yeah. But the Fiat 500 should probably be the Volkswagen Beetle. Maybe. Mm, I don't know. But that was uh, that was two seconds in the episode. That's a fun little aside. I like it. Yeah. What is your greatest car of all time? I'll put you on the spot. Oh, oh man. Dude, the F1's up there. That's such a car. <laughs> like, the a car company crazy enough to be like, screw it, one seat in the middle, Go! That's well, I guess actually it's three seats with one in the middle. Yeah, two in the. It's got a back seat. Yeah, yeah. but um, yeah, I like the the boldness to be like, is it left hand drive or right hand drive? Yes, all, all the drive, <laughs> all hand drive. <laughs> you don't know. I I wouldn't put the McLaren F one. I wouldn't put the Mustang or the Silver Cloud. E Type Jag might be. It could possibly be the best car of all time. See, calling, I mean, the best car is like so when somebody asks me what's my favorite beer. I'm like, that's just, you can't answer, you can't ask that question because like there's so many different, it's such a different, it, it's a wide range. Because if you're the talking e- like the- most iconic, most reliable, most, uh, you know, the there's just a lot of things, a lot of caveats. The E Type Jag is my Odell's 90 shilling. Fair enough. I mean, the E Type, I, I have no qualms with that pick. Yeah. It's a very good car. It's hard to argue against a few of these. All right, let's move on. So this weird little concept, the XKRR, uh, I wrote down ugly. I mean, it, it looks ugly. like an XKR. It's no different, yeah. you know. It's it looks another R. It's it's exactly like the DB7 GT. It's taking an it existing is. car and kind of make the suspension better. Like that's that's it. That's all I did. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know how good or bad the XKR original is, right? The XK, I guess. Regular XK. R. Yeah, regular. Uh, that's, what, that's what one of the two R stands for. Um, <laughs> really XK regular. Uh, there was the XK, there was one more concept of this one that I didn't write down on this list, but it was the XKRS, which is essentially the same thing in a convertible. Okay. All right. Um so I mean, it's it's both of these cars I talk about in the segment are essentially the same thing, except yeah. for one's presumably like fifty thousand pounds more than the other because it's yep. Aston Martin. Um, yep. But you know, it's I guess it's kind of exciting to have both of these cars are they're not new, like they're not new body styles or new motors nope. or anything like that. It's just kind of better suspension and. I don't know. I'm. I'm. I. I don't really know the point of this review. I guess just to show off the GT because I think the GT did come out in 2003. Yeah, it would have been like GT. the newish. Yeah, uh, Aston. But uh, I mean, it's they added yeah this. They changed the spoiler, the louvers, and the grill, and uh, the louvers on the hood. 
And yeah, looking at Clarkson in that, he was talking about how cramped it was. And I was like, you look very cramped. Like, uh-huh. that. why are you liking this car? I mean, I don't... It's one thing to have a fun car, but it's, if you're not comfortable, like, at all, ever, ugh. Yeah, he, uh, he, he kind of started the episode off. He did his, his uh, <clears throat> like, his patented switcheroo. He gave, you a, he gave you the old Top Gear switcheroo. It's time, therefore, to tuck the DB7 up in bed with a nice mug of cocoa and let Jaguar make that brilliant XKRR instead, except for one tiny detail. This GT version is not just a cynical marketing exercise. It's not just a beard to cover up the wrinkles. What it is, is amazing. Everything is awesome in here. And so, apparently, it's really fun to drive. Uh, yeah. Better than the original DB7. He had commented, and this, both you and I don't think the DB7 is a terribly good-looking car. No. He commented that uh, he didn't like the body and, you know, trim additions that were added to this. But, you know, when Sean Connery grew a beard, my wife still fancied him. So, apparently, the original one is like Sean Connery, and this is like Sean Connery in Highlander. I'm not sure. Um, but... It's still not that great of a looking car. I think it. It, yeah. I it's, wish it was I, a Vanquish. Why don't agreed. you look as good as a Vanquish? <laughs> look more better. Look, you can do it. You're doing it right now. We already looked at it, but yeah, I uh, I don't mind the additions. I don't mind the bulges and the bul- the hard lines and stuff like that of the addition of the mm-hmm. body. But it's an old car. I'm not excited by it. Uh, and it's expensive. Only 190 were made. So right. like, even if you were excited by it, you probably couldn't get it. Yep. And I think of that, 62 of them came to the United States. So, All right. If you see well, that's a lot for Aston at the time, but... Ugh. I suppose. Um, yeah. I liked his... Uh, this is one thing I do remember from this episode, uh, is the 0 to 135 in one gear. That's pretty cool. He started yeah. off at a dead stop, put it into fourth, took, you know, started driving away just fine, no problems. I guess, you know, it's got 410 foot-pounds of torque. It gets a lot of torque. But yeah, it'll get you going. I don't. He didn't give me a time. It'd be interesting to see what the time was on that. But it seemed like a it was a lot. I mean, it seemed like it. You know, like what, like twenty, thirty seconds, something like that. Yeah, I'd, I'd put it in the like probably low twenties. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's not bad. But uh, yeah, it is. It's it's a silly thing. But yeah, I remember it being like, yeah, I remember that stat. That's something that's stuck in my head from this episode. And maybe what at the time, what would be a good zero to one hundred time? Like ten? Oof. Yeah, in the neighborhood. So double that, and you don't to, use any zero gears. To 60, yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. I guess it's got some balls. It's got it's got some torque on the low end there. Um, yeah. Well, it's that 6 liter V12 still, so yeah, that thing's got gobs of torque. Yeah, I mean, it's the same one that's in the old DB7. This is... Yep. This, just the it's, same car with better suspension. Just put the better... Sus- the suspension. Just put the better suspension on the regular car. No. No. <laughs> Then he no. can't sell the expensive one, Brady. Yeah, well, it's 104,000 pounds. And unfortunately for all of us, it is the power lap this week. So yeah. it did a 130.4 in the dry. I commented that it was quite rolly. Uh, yeah. There was a lot of body roll. Clarkson it's really just a liked big car. Road. It means it's GT, a, Grand yeah. Touring. Like, that's not a race car. No. So... Uh, I guess all the suspension additions they did did not make it better around the track. But it did a 130.4, which is pretty good. You know, middle of the pack. Yeah. Yeah. Costs a lot. Um, yeah. For our Top Gear rear view power rankings, what is your desirability score out of 10, Jeff? I'm going to give it a four. Four. Yeah, it's pretty bad. I was going to say, you know, it still is an Aston Martin. I was going to give it a five. You know. All right. That's, that's pretty Fair good. Enough. It's got a it's still uh, got the big V12 in it. I'm not a huge fan of the, this. Is better looking than the DB7 that they showed in the last season. They have messed with the headlights a little bit, and it turns out I'm a bit of a headlight snob. So they fixed the headlights, so it's not just like a plastic lens over a flat headlight, deep set yeah. within the body. So they fixed that, so that's good. Um, but it's still, you know, it's not that great looking. The no, whole back no. end doesn't look very good. All right, so that's a four it's for you. It's too long. That was my complaint. I think the whole thing, it, like, it looks like the back end should have been shortened by about a foot, and just like the proportion just kind of squished back in there, and it looked way better. Mm, maybe. Like the F-type? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just a shorter a shorter ass. <laughs> just just a little too much ass. <laughs> just uh, the ass at a bit. The overall score for this was a 95.3, so not good. 
giving nope. it an eight. Tenth spot out of twenty four. Right. Um, uh, so eighteenth spot, right ahead of the Maserati Coupe. Which okay, I put this in the same realm as the Maserati Coupe. I'd put it. I mean, it's the dollars that kill it because, like, if they were the same price, this thing would be miles ahead of a Coupe. But that's true. Such it is. We we rated it higher as well, and then right behind uh, the Lamborghini. Five seven five at Marinella. <laughs> it seems to come up every week, but no, not the 575 Marinello. Okay, the Lamborghini okay. Murcielago, which is all really right. held back by its 160,000 pound price tag. It's all money, man. It's all money. But uh, yeah, not a great car. Low on the power rankings. We'll post those up uh, later in the week uh, on Facebook. All right, and that uh, that closes us off. That is the end of the episode. So very Jaguar specific. So uh, super British episode, but so be it. So they come. Um Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, uh, we always appreciate uh, reviews and ratings on iTunes, and uh, and we are still taking. If you got them, your uh, your five worst cars, as well as your best and worst headlights, throw those <laughs> up on Facebook. Yeah, it, let us know what you think of the greatest car vote little that too, yeah. snippet that we found here. Uh, do you think the McLaren F1 should be on the list, and what is the greatest car, and why isn't the Etai Jag? Uh, yeah, also, I said earlier, uh, we have the Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash Top Gear Rear View. We like to post up car stuff that we find, uh, either race car stuff or engine or concept or whatever we can find on the internet, as well as uh, our Top Gear Rear View power rankings, which, if you do not know what it is, it is our normalization for cost and speed for all the cars tested on Top Gear and put around the track. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's better than just the Top Gear power laps because, you know, a Pagani Zonda's like, Four hundred million dollars. Yes, it's yeah. fast, but it, I'm never going to buy one. So, nope. how does it actually relate to a Ford Focus? And this is our our chance at uh, trying to get those in line. So, I like to post the top ten every week, and then what cars we talked about in that week's episode. All right, buddy. Well, I think that's it for the week. So, uh, until next week, uh, we will talk to you guys all later. <laughs>